it's an absolute pleasure and privilege to be here. Um, I remember, I think about three or four months ago, I spoke to um, some of the students, the current um, the class of, of the Faith Foundation. Um, and I had, I had quite a long conversation or quite a long speech and presentation, but um, your president, um, Tony, has um, stolen my thunder and said almost everything I want to say. So we both stand, we all stand here not knowing what I really want to say, but I do have a few messages. One of the things I don't want to do today is lecture. Um, I want to share some unique experiences, some personal experiences, um, some of my own thoughts, and tell you a few stories. Some of them you may have heard before, some of them you may have not. So, um, you know, talking about where we are in the world, where we are in Nigeria today, how do we position our business for the future? Um, the first story I want to tell is a story I told exactly, I think, 12 years ago. Um, and it's a story about my cousin Ike. And I was almost thrown out um, or thrown off my, my um, speaking my speech when I walked in and the first lady I met said to me, oh, I saw you speak at the TEDx conference in London in 2010. And I thought, oh gosh, I'm going to tell exactly the same story. Um, but it's okay. I'm, going to, I'm not deterred. I'll tell it anyway. Um, but the reason I want to tell this story is because it encapsulates the Nigerian spirit. It encapsulates what we have to do as entrepreneurs or intrapreneurs. And if we want to be successful in life, um, we've got to be, basically, we've got to be motivated, we've got to be passionate, we've got to pursue excellence, and we've got to do things in a way that nobody else can. Um, there's no blueprint to success, but the ingredients of success, you know, is passion and dedication. As they say, um, you know, success always leaves clues. So my cousin Ike, um, young man, graduated from university and looked for a job like we all did or we will all do. Unfortunately for Ike, he couldn't find a job. Nobody employed him, so he decided to employ himself. Um, now, what did he do in university? He was an, electronics, um, an electrical engineering student. So he thought, you know what, I'll open an electronics store. Actually, not far from here. There's some, there's some fact and some fiction in this story, but not far from here. Somewhere in Surya, he opened this electronics store. And in, um, after a few months, maybe two, three, four months, it actually did quite well. People bought a lot of these electronics, and um, he was successful, more or less. And he was happy he did that. So he was, his own brand of entrepreneurship had been launched. Um, at Christmas, he went home to his friends and family, celebrated a little bit, bought them a few things, and talked, you know, boasted proudly about his electronics store got back to work in January, and to his surprise and dismay, there was another store right next to him, on the left of him, and it had a big sign on the top, and it said, lowest prices here. What he then found out, it was opened by his first cousin, who he had been boasting about, like how successful the electronics business in Lagos is. So, um, so there he was, he thought, well, they're going to take a bit of my margins, but you know, there's competition in life, so we get on with it. Um, got to Easter three, four months later. He had done all right. Margins had dropped a bit. And then he went back, had a, hosted the party to, for his friends and family again and said, you know, we're still here. Got back after Easter, got to the shop, and again to his uh, surprise and amazement. On the right side of his shop this time, there was another big shop selling electronics, exactly the same product line. And it said, best deals here. And he thought to himself, I mean, how can you work in a competitive environment? He sat down, he was about to give up, and he thought, no, giving up is not, for, is not for me. So what did he do? He went to the market, he made a sign, he put it on the top of his shop, and he said, main entrance here. So, so, what, so what does that actually mean? Well, you know, in this country, you can no longer be a one-trick pony, right? You need to be motivated. You need to be resilient. You're going to have challenges. You're going to have competition. You're going to have people that will put you down. And you're going to have people that will bring you up. You're going to have people that will challenge you. But whatever you do in life, be adaptable, right? And just try to make sure that you, you continue the journey that you started, right? Um, as I say, the passion will start. The conviction will make you continue, right? But there's certain ingredients that you need to make sure that you're actually successful on the path to success. And over the next sort of 10, 15 minutes, I will talk about what I think um, are some of those ingredients. So I've got to really learn how to use this. I think I've, I've done half of this slide without actually um, referring to it. So, um, so, well, so we, I've spoken about my cousin Ike, and, and I think, again, I'm gonna nip what, what Toyin said in her, in, in her opening speech, what the president said. You know, I can assure you that irrespective of the good, the bad, and the ugly, and I, I, I say in Nigeria, you've got all sides, and I term the good are the people, 
I mean, you, no way in the world will you meet people this resilient, this happy, this motivated, right? So that's the basic goals, and everybody knows that. Um, different people have the bad. Um, for me, the bad is the regulatory environment. I think, um, I think we're fighting against the tide all the time. The environment doesn't always um, favor what we want to do. Once in a while, um, it helps, um, but 90% of the times it doesn't. So you have to make your own luck in this place. Um, the ugly is the macro, the macroeconomics. What really happens um, in, a, in a country like this, in a state where we are and in the industries we're in, um, right now there's blood on the streets. It's almost impossible to, to do business and, and be successful um, just on a numbers basis, right? But you know, like everything, these things will pass. There were the good times, uh, maybe these are the bad times, but there will be the absolutely great times. So we've got to really sort of stick with this. Um, so one of my key messages today is you're exactly where you need to be to make the change you want to see. Don't wait for anybody else to do it. What about me? At the age of 10, I was sent to boarding school in Nigeria. Actually, I had a lot of friends here. I actually played football in, in this place. I used to come here and then there was a Catholic... Um, there was a Catholic club, Helmbridge. I'm not even sure it's still around here, but I used to go to, to Helmbridge to, to sort of have fun and to socialize. Uh, anyway, after the age of 10, after my, my secondary school in Ijaniki, I went on to read a, a course in architecture at the University of Nigeria. From there, I went to London and I went to several, several institutions in London. But I did find out one thing about myself is that although I like um, sort of architecture and buildings. What I realized is I like the people element of architecture and buildings, so the business end of it. So I did a construction management degree, um, I did a property development degree, and I did an MBA. Um, after that, I went to work with an architectural practice for a few years. Then I went to work with a company called Regis. And when I arrived at Regis, um, it had literally just started by a man, a man called Mark Dixon. Um, he was probably in his early 30s, maybe late 20s, early 30s. He had sold his family bakery for 200,000 euros and started this business. Um, when I came to work for him, he asked me if I could work for free. Um, and he would give me 5% of his shares. Um, and he, I mean, it was, I mean, it was quite, a, you know, it was one of the places I worked and I thought entrepreneurs are not, they're not made, they're actually born. There's some ingredients you have to have from the beginning. And this guy sort of rolled the dice every day. So I learned a lot from him, but I couldn't work for free. I had a family to feed, a mortgage to pay. I had bread and butter issues, real, real issues. So um, I couldn't work for free. He hired seven people from seven different continents. I was the African. And um, so I, I agreed the salary. Anyway, to cut a long story short, in that period of time, I traveled to 68 countries, I opened 190 offices, I dealt with his property and logistics, then I learned a lot of things, I met most people, all the experiences I had, what I hadn't witnessed, I had literally either read about or heard about. Um, and I thought by the age of, I think then I was about 31 or so, by the age of 30, 31, I had witnessed most varying situations in life. Thank, thankfully to this. But anyway, eight years later, from starting with Regis, he floated the company on the New York Stock Exchange for $1.4 billion. All my colleagues, the six other colleagues that he started the company with, plus me, they took the 5%. They cashed checks of $75 million each. I got a handshake, a pat on the back, and uh, well done, Paul. You're a great guy, right? And I thought <laughs> at the time, it's, it's sort of very difficult, but I thought at the time that, you know, why is life so unfair? And we'll talk a little bit about that, that later. Um, but when I look back, if I had cashed a check at the age of 31 of $75 million, I can guarantee you I wouldn't be standing right here today. I may be either in a mental hospital, in a home, right, six foot under the ground, or just doing the things that not many people really want to do or to be seen doing. So um, I'm glad that happened because it was a real experience in life. And um, I'm going to tell you some of the stories um, that makes that... Uh, that's, that sort of endorses that view. So um, where am I today, right? Um, some of you probably have been to Landmark and we started this business 25 years ago. And we started it but with a service office business. We had opened basically service offices in 14 different cities in Africa, a few in Europe as well. Um, and some of you that know the story, we moved from Europe to Africa and then, then to Nigeria. So we started with the world, um, came into the continent, came to the country and now we're in Lagos um, and we're concentrating all our efforts here. Right? But I can, I'd like to say, you know, 10 years ago we bought the piece of land you know um, as landmark today, maybe slightly more than 10 years ago. It was marshland, it was swampy and there was nothing really there, there were no roads, no streets. Um, today, 
It is the most visited business, leisure, and lifestyle destination on the West African coast. Don't clap for me. I'm the Mark Dixon. I'm the guy offering people 5%. It's the people who are working in Landmark, the hard, the hard men and women working in Landmark um, that have really made what we are today possible. They've relentlessly believed in the vision and they've relentlessly executed it. But some of the theories, so, so some of the theories um, of, of um, relentless execution, yes, um, we will talk about in my next few slides. So, um, the first story I'm going to tell you is that of staying power. So many people um, go into business and at the first hurdle, um, they say, look, this is not for me. Why does it have to be so hard? I always say to people, the, all the easy things have been done. If you want to be successful, it's going to be difficult, it's going to be hard. So one thing you have to have is staying power. Um, one of the stories that I remember is, um, I'm sure some of you know Domino, Domino Pizza. Have you heard of Domino Pizza? So it was started quite a few years ago by two brothers, um, Tom and James. Um, Tom and James started dom their first Domino Pizza shop with 500, I think $500. And um, after a few years, they were reasonably successful. They had opened a few shops. And then James said, you know what? I'm going to cash in my stick. He sold half of his stick to his brother. Just for a few multiples of the 500, I think it was $7,500. Sold a 50% stake. So his brother owned everything. So Tom owned everything, took it forward. James bought a Volkswagen with, with his stake, you know, and drove around with his friends and stuff. And I had a nice time while Tom was sweating. Well, fast forward the clock. Domino Pizza today has 14,000 branches. Yes. It's in 90 different countries. It's worth $13 billion. Tom has bought 40% of the shares in Volkswagen that James used his shares to buy the car, right? Stay in power. Tom and James had a hard life. You know, if you, if you read the story, they grew up in an orphanage. Um, they, you know, they ended up in, I think they ended up in youth detention centers and stuff, and they just decided it's time. You know, the, the, pro the travesty of this story is that James was the one who had the idea to start Domino Pizza, but Tom reaped all the benefits. Why? Because he had stay in power. Um, so um, the Olympic mindset. Many people talk about the Olympic mindset, but very few people have the courage, the ability, the passion, the drive to actually execute the Olympic mindset. I always say the difference between greatness and mediocrity is an extremely thin and slim line. Um, some of you may have heard this story. I don't know how many of you are sports fans here, but um, some of you may watch Olympics. Well, the 1936 Olympics, which was the Olympics just after the war, um, the 200 meters, you may remember or you may have heard about the most celebrated icon of that Olympics was a guy called Jesse Owen, right? He was a black guy, he ran the 200 meters, he broke the world record. What most of you don't know is there's another guy called Matthew Robinson. Matthew Robinson also broke the 200 meter world record. He came second. He was second by one fourth of a second. Jesse Owen went on to become a world renowned star. Matthew Robinson went on to become a janitor, and he died as a janitor and as a poor man. The difference was one fourth of a second, right? So let that sink in. You know, you have to always take personal responsibility for achieving the absolute highest part of your potential. You know, you never want to go to bed and say, I wish I had done more, right? And the Olympic mindset means always push things, challenge those boundaries of pain, challenge those boundaries you know, of comfort. Get out of your comfort zone and pursue things in a way that nobody else can do it in. And that's what the Olympic mindset is. And I think that that's one of probably the key anchors of a successful business, as a, as of a successful entrepreneur, and certainly a successful intrapreneur. So we talk about daring to dream. Um, I mean, I have a landmark picture here, um, but you can more or less say this and think about this everywhere, right? Um, you know, what one needs to do when one dreams, you need to upgrade your dream to, to a conviction. And then you need to upgrade that conviction to reality. And then you need to upgrade that reality to your destiny, right? So dreaming is great. But you know, um, I've forgotten the person that said, I think it was Ashley Bright, is everybody has a great idea, right? But very few people, have the ability to actually mine, execute that idea to perfection, 
right? So um, every time I see someone and, and you know, I, I think it said, look, I was on the Lion's Den program and I, I, obviously I see a lot of entrepreneurs and talk to a lot of entrepreneurs. For me, the difference is not the idea. Everybody has an idea. The difference is that person's conviction and that person's ability. So I look in the eyes and I say, will this person stay when the going gets tough, right? If the person stays when the going gets tough, they're usually successful. Um, if they walk, um, then you're going to lose your money. <laughs> so um, the next thing is passionate. I've said a lot about being passionate. Um, be passionate, be driven. I remember the story, um, I don't know how many of you know the story in, of the, um, the El Cortez Hotel in San Diego, um, when there's a janitor who had worked there for 19 years, and the hotel um, was thriving, was doing extremely well, but um, it had outgrown its infrastructure. And when they built this hotel, it had only one elevator. So they, so they, were, they, they brought all the sort of architects and, and business people together and said, look, how do we make sure we can fulfill our potential in this hotel? Because we've got so many clients. How do we put a second elevator so people can get to the top? And they thought of cutting holes through the floors. They thought of drilling. They thought of converting the staircase. They thought of expanding the core. And so there were so many things they thought of. At the end of the day, they decided to cut the holes through the store, through the floors. The problem is that they would have had to close the hotel for, I think, three or four months to do that. It was going to be expensive. It was going to be dusty. And they would have had, to, and they would have had no clients. And they would have needed a lot of money. Um, the janitor heard this, right, whilst he was cleaning. And he thought to himself that if they close the hotel for that period of time, obviously he hasn't got a job. So he walks up to the principal of the hotel and he says, I heard you talking about putting the elevator in and you're going to close this hotel. Um, and he said, yes, we're doing X, Y, Z, but why do you want to know? He says, well, he doesn't want to lose his job, but he has a great idea. And the principal said, well, you know, okay, what's that idea? I'm in a hurry, right? And he said, have you ever thought of putting the elevator on the outside? So you don't have to close the hotel, you build the elevator and you run the hotel. And the principal thought to himself, wow, that's actually a good idea. Um, I don't know how, how many of you have been to San Diego, but that hotel is probably one of the top three hotels in San Diego. It's known for a lot, but more importantly, that janitor went on to become the principal of that hotel. He managed that hotel. The rooms and some of the conference rooms there are named after him. He, he was an astounding, an astounding success. And why? He was passionate, he was thoughtful, but what drove him was the passion to keep his job, yes? Where did he get to? He got to that height and he got to that ceiling. Excellence. So we all talk about excellence. Um, we talk about it in abundance. Um, as I, when I said that Tony stole my, my speech, my entire theme of what I speak about day in, day out is about excellence. I, do, I, do, I think this is the number one ingredient, right? To make sure you get from A to B. Right. So, um, you know, the great thing about us in Nigeria is that excellence here is an absolute currency. Yeah. There's loads of opportunities to be excellent. There are very few people who have the desire or the will to be excellent. So there's so little competition. But once you're excellent, yes, you will always get to where you want to be. I mean, you just simply couldn't fail with excellence. Um, next slide. Be principled. So, um, you know, people talk about principles often. You know, and, and again, it's like excellence. It's a currency. You know, if you're honest, you're reliable, your principle of your word is your bond. People just generally come back all the time. They trust you. Um, you make very long-term decisions. You behave in a long-term manner rather than a short-term manner. Someone once said to me, you know, live your life today. And I agree. Live your life today. You know, reflect on the past. Plan for the future, but live in the moment. But while you're living in the moment, just remember that there's a future. So don't do the things that will affect your future. And that's what principles are all about. Principles are about how you want to be seen in the future. You apply today. So um, being principles is, is certainly very important. So generally, just be a good person. And a good, nobody needs to describe what a good person is. It's easier to be bad, by the way, than to be good. But be a good person. Next. And resilience. We've talked a lot about resilience. Um, very, few, very few people don't agree or very few people would say they're not resilient. Yeah? But resilience is when you, can, you go into a challenge, you feel you're outside your comfort zone, you're being pushed back, yet you still drive forward. That's what resilience is. Um, but what resilience means, resilience means you're prepared to fail. It doesn't really mean that you're strong or you're brave. It means that I will fail, 
I will die trying, even if I don't succeed. Um, I don't know how many of you here know Michael Jordan, but um, and you know that famous Michael Jordan quote? He said, you know, he has played 9,000 basketball games. He lost 300 games. You know, he, he took, oh God, I've forgotten all the numbers, but I think there were about 150, 160 different shots. He had the opportunity to win a game with the game-winning shot and lost it 26 times. He has failed and failed and failed again. But you know what? He has succeeded because he's the world's most famous number one basketball player, right? Despite the number of times he fails. Um, and that's why um, resilience is important because once you're not afraid to fail, you will um, succeed. But to understand failure um, or to understand success, you need to fail a couple of times. So um, I've given you some of what I feel are my are my nuggets. As I said, I, I wasn't going to lecture you. I was going to tell you a few stories. So I'll, I'll, I'll follow up my next few slides with a few useful, what I call useful tools and hints. So the first one is um, surround yourself with people you, like you, that you want to be. It's very, very understated. And not a lot of people understand the value of it, right? But surround yourself. If you're ambitious, surround yourself with ambitious friends, right? If you're not ambitious, it's okay. But if you're ambitious, surround yourself with ambitious friends. When two friends, three friends, four friends have gotten together that have equal ambition, you know what it does? It creates competition. The things you talk about, the things you do, right, are things that make you better. Um, you would have heard all the stories. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure you've heard this sort of um, the Google story, Larry Page and, and Sergey Brin. Um, they were great friends, childhood friends. They grew up, they challenged each other. Um, today, there are five billion people that use Google. We've heard the Microsoft story, the Microsoft story of Paul Allen and, and Bill Gates. Again, friends, yes? Um, they work together, they challenged each other. Right? And there's several stories. I'm just telling the most popular ones. But there's several stories. But do surround yourself with ambitious friends. And in any business you're in, surround yourself with people that want to go to the places you want to go to. Not with the people who are like, oh, it's all right. Let's party tonight. Um, the next tool I'll say, um, network relentlessly. A lot of people undervalue um, networking. Right? We feel that... You know, I'm out of my comfort zone. I don't really want to see people. I can read this in a book or I can talk to my friends. Network really, the more people you know that you don't know, the better you are for it. You know? Um, um, oh God, there's a, there was a, there was a, um, a phrase I've, I've actually forgotten. Um, but this goes to something like your net worth is your network, right? It's so important to actually network, to meet people. As a matter of fact, I read a statistic, 73% of professional jobs in the world, yes, are result, as a result of networking. Not necessarily your CV, just loose networking. And there was a book, and I've forgotten who wrote it, um, but it was called, it was called um, gosh, I wrote this down, down somewhere. Um, it was called The Strength of Weak Ties. I've forgotten who wrote the book, but it's a great book. And what it does, it, it preaches the value of networking, right? And what networking does, it doesn't mean that you're making lifelong friends. It means you have some weak ties. I met you here. I met Tony here. We had a, a conversation. Three years later, there's a break I need. I see Tony on TV. I call her. I say, Tony, remember me? I sat next to you in that place. And she says, oh, yes. Yeah, so how are you? I said, I need a favor. That's what networking is. Yeah, right? It's so important um, to create the strength of loose ties. Increase your surface area of luck. Um, so a lot of people say, um, well, she was just lucky or he was just lucky. You know, luck is intentional. Um, don't get me wrong. Luck is incredibly intentional. Um, I'm sure. So I wanted to tell the story, the Lee Byung story, the Samsung story. Um, so what do you mean by increase your surface area of luck? Um, so Lee Byung, the first thing he did with his family was vegetables. Then he did furniture. Um, then I think he did used cars. Then he moved into electronics. Um, and, and I think for the older ones in the room, we remember the, the black and white TVs that turned to color. Um, stop nodding. You're not old enough to remember black and white TV. <laughs> then then um, today, I'm sure most of you, at least the younger ones in the room, know Samsung for the phones, right? It's been one of the most successful companies on planet Earth, right? And why? 
because Lee Bong increased his surface area for luck. Some people say I'd rather be lucky than I'm smart. But you know what, what luck actually does, uh, what, what this increasing of the surface area for luck actually does, it actually challenges that conventional wisdom um, or that notion that luck is by chance. It's not. It's not by chance. You have to do it. You have to be intentional about it. You have to do things several times um, to create your luck. Yes, you have, you have to actually cultivate a fertile ground so luck can prevail. Yeah? Luck doesn't just come. A guy, a guy selling oranges, yes? if you sit at the back of a building and you put your oranges on a tray and you wait for people to pass by and buy the oranges, you're likely not to sell a lot of oranges. If you get into the middle of the road, the traffic intersection, you risk your life with the cars moving, you smell a few fumes, you put your oranges in through people's windows, you're likely to sell more oranges, right? You're both lucky that someone bought the orange, but one person increased the surface area of luck a lot more than the other. Um, know, know your numbers. It's, oh, yes. Know your numbers. Understand your market. It's so important in business to actually understand the market. So I always hear people say, and I see this a lot on the, um, on the Lions Den program. Someone comes and says, there are 200 million Nigerians. Um, if 10% of, of, of these Nigerians um, look at my product, um, that means 20 million Nigerians. If 10% of those buy it, that's 2 million people buying it. My product is valued at $10 a head, and then they, they extrapolate, right? The easiest way to fail. Easiest way to fill. You have to know your market. Many people say, so I'll give you some tight examples. Let's say, let's look at India, for instance, and Nigeria, right? Indian Nigeria, fast growing population, a lot of infrastructure challenges, loads of opportunity, yes? And, and on the face of it, you know, growing middle class, you know, governments neither here nor there, right? But on the face of it, they look similar, right? But the things you do in India, if you try them in Nigeria, you will fail. And the things you do in Nigeria, if you try them in India, you're unlikely to succeed because there's some small nuances that are different, right? Um, Nigerian people have a... Oh, let me not get into politics, <laughs> right? Um, let me leave it like that. So the two countries with a lot of the same headline indices, indices but very, very different. Um, so knowing your numbers is important. Um, I was reading a story about, about Bill Gates and, um, and Bill Gates said that when he started Microsoft, um, he approached 1,200 people. Of the 1,200 people, 900 people said, not interested. 300 people said, I'll think about it. Of the 300 people, 85 of them actually did think about it. Right? Of the 85, 30 of them took it a step further. Of the 30, only 11 of them actually got involved. Those 11 people made him a billionaire, right? So you, the fact that you started with 1,200, right? And less than, or yeah, less than 1% responded positively doesn't mean you will fail, right? You've got to stick with it. You've got to believe in it. Um, but you've got to actually know the market you're in and you've got to know your numbers. You've got to know what makes it tick. Um, Oh, I've just finished speaking about know your numbers. Yes. So, um, I don't know whether anybody's heard of the theory of balance. The theory of balance. And, and the theory of balance is that in your youth, and even in our adulthood, most people say, you know what, I want a balanced life. I want friends, I want family, I want work, I want sports, I want health. You know, I've got news for you. The reality is, unless you're a genius, right, the theory of balance is a fallacy, right? You literally have to choose exactly what it is that's important to you, yes, and excel in that. And all the other things, you've got to find a way to cope, yeah, right? And there's some statistics on this. 98% of people, yes, that choose to have several routes rather than one thing that they key on, don't actually achieve it. The theory of balance is a fallacy. It is unlikely unless you are A, extremely lucky, B, you're a genius, that you ever reach the upper rungs of economic security if balance is your priority. It's fact. Um, statistically, it's a fact. 
and in reality it's a fact and i'm not saying here i'm not saying don't get a life and hopefully my wife is not watching this and saying ah, i now see why you haven't been calling me right but, but the reality is that it's it's a fact yes you've got to choose what you want to achieve in the moment you want to achieve it right and focus on it and not allow allow for distractions um we've talked about choosing Thank you. Thank you. So we've talked about choosing. Um, so you always choose which one you want to be. I think I've, I've more or less um, dealt with this slide. Yes. The next thing I'd like to talk about is equality. So equality, it, the starting point of equality, or the theme or theory of equality is that everybody has 24 hours. We all have the same resources available to us. It's what you do with your 24 hours that actually counts. The theory of trade-off, yes, is you know, one has to always remember that whatever you choose to do, yes, you're going to make some sacrifices. So aspire for greatness, but just remember that it entails sacrifice. You don't become great without sacrifice. It's never an easy road. The road to success is always under um, construction. So the last slide and the last thing I want to say is the just world fallacy. Um, the fact that most people think in life you get what you deserve. I'm sorry, it's not true. It's absolutely not true. Life is not fair. You don't get what you deserve. It's, it never happens like that. Noble actions are not always rewarded. Evil actions are not always punished. We see it in Nigeria day after day. We see it in our businesses and we've seen it in our youth, right? The just world fa fallacy is not true. You've got to make your own luck. You've got to stop believing in the word fair. And when people come up to you and say it's not fair, you say the world is not fair. Make your own luck. And um, so my last slide, we're talking about opportunities in this dis dispensation. Um, so I'd like to leave you with a thought of exactly this, yes? The opportunity of a lifetime can only be realized in the lifetime of that opportunity. So if today you're thinking of doing something that you think is an opportunity of a lifetime, don't say to yourself, well, let me finish school, or let me finish work, or let me get home first, or let me have a chat with my brother or my sister. Right? The opportunity of a lifetime is time-specific. When you come back next time, it's not the same opportunity. So if you look at the market today and you say, yes, the currency is on the run, you know, um, infrastructure is bad, and there are all sorts of things going against us right now in our macro environment, but there's a lot of opportunity. That opportunity is dealing with the macro environment today. If this environment improves and you think that opportunity is still the same, you won't be able to reap it the same way. Um, so I'd like to leave you with a saying that I started with. You're exactly where you want to be to make the change you want to see.